the channel is uh, depconf 18-z on OFTC. And this is um, uh, on demand unboxing buff. I have entirely forgotten already how I titled it, which is entirely fine. And basically, yeah, my uh, goal, I would say, was to talk about how we can provide a better experience with uh, sandboxing applications and so on uh, for users and developers. And I, I guess I would love to start with who you all are and what you want to talk about and things like that. So I guess I already did introduce what I want to talk about, but I'm Nico, I've been a Debian contributor for a couple of years. Hi, and have a seat please. Uh, so I was saying I'm Nico, I have been a Debian contributor for a couple of years, still not a DD because I'm particularly lazy about doing the paperwork thing, but at least I started the NM process again. And yeah, generally my interest is in, in this topic is partly because I, you know, do not particularly, uh, particularly like uh, running code from the inter uh, random code from the internet on my laptop with all my permissions, and partly because I, um, yeah, because I think it's a worthwhile problem to fix. Hi, I'm Julian. I'm from the App Team, and my interest basically is uh, the ability. Basically, I, what I'd like to see is to have uh, untrusted apps I can just install from the internet and run without having to trust it and without it having access to my data and my webcam or whatever. I'm Paul. Um, I'm interested in converting the Debian archive into flat packs. Uh, I'm Tagatsugu no Kubi. Uh, I'm mainly uh, maintaining some kind of uh, natural process um, natural language processing packages, especially for Japanese. Um, I'm Alex Doyle. I'm a build engineer at uh, Cumulus Networks, and uh, my interest in this was providing isolated build environments for developers to build in. So currently we're using um, Shroots for that, but it takes a while to get in and out of them. And we're looking at Docker containers as well as maybe an option uh, for, for, for providing isolated build environments because we have a shared build systems. We don't want developers stomping over each other every time they install new packages. So I'm curious as to what sort of sandboxing technologies and options are out there. Uh, <coughs> I'm Shia. I'm an SRE. We are using Docker and Kubernetes. So I'm curious if there's some other options. Uh, I mean, other than Docker. Uh, and it's working for us. Thank you. OK, so that's all. Okay, uh, so you did not wish to introduce yourself, or? I was looking to your friend uh, behind you. That's entirely okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you wish to speak, please use one of the microphones. We have plenty of those. And I did that without speaking into the microphone. So yeah, see, there are quite a, we have quite a few people interested. Uh, some of which, like some of you, uh, seem to be uh, more uh, heavily interested in like uh, build environments. Some of uh, you are interested in having uh, more or less more desktop sandboxing kind of stuff. Uh, thankfully, uh, at least from my from my perspective, a lot of the problems are, are the same, uh, in the sense that we we need to provide clean environments with, um, and we need to do this relatively fast. Uh, actually, how many people here are using SBuild or SCH root? What? Oh, sorry, I was asking if you ever used uh, SBuild or SCH root. Okay, hi. Hi, uh, you just missed the round of introduction, so would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Ben Asimov. 
My name is Vivek Das Mahapatra. I work for uh, Calabra. Um, we are currently my major projects are assigned with Valve, as part of which I'm working on um, uh, runtime uh, shared library isolation technology. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was saying, uh, oh, uh, feel free to sit more in here if you want, and also feel free to introduce yourself. I'm from the uh, kernel team, mainly uh, man maintain uh, ARM EL kernel. Um, yeah, so the, um, the reason why I ask you how many people use SBuild and SCH root here is because SCH root is the closest thing we have to more or less end demand sandboxed environment in uh, Debian currently. Of course, it's it has two major problems. The first one is that it's not a particularly good security boundary in the sense that it's just a shroud. And uh, uh, well, these days we have a bunch of, uh, uh, we, we have a, there are better uh, isolation features in the kernel we should be taking advantage of, like namespaces and uh, seccomp filtering and, um, and possibly, uh, um, and possibly uh, security modules like Apamo, not now that we have one which is available by default. Um, full disclaimer, I, I am on the Apamo team, so I am slightly biased in favor of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so generally, like one of the questions I've been asking myself is, oh, to be entirely fair, uh, it was prompted by Indri, who recently pointed out that SCH root does most of what I want, just not, uh, it's not particularly fast at it, because, I mean, I don't know if you, for those of you who run SBuild, the first thing SBuild does is it, it updates apt in a, the CH root, it runs an install in the CH root, and that already takes by itself most of a minute, and waiting a minute to start an application is not particularly good. Oh, waiting a minute to enter your development environment is also not particularly good. Um, so, oh, actually, I guess I can just ask you a question, Julian. Uh, how terrible uh, would it be if uh, we did things like not actually installing packages inside the sandbox, as in not even running apt inside the sandbox and just extracting the dev in there? Well, it depends on the dev, right? So, like a desktop application probably would crash if you don't run the maintainer scripts because it has stuff like G settings which you need to update, like the, uh, you need to update the database for. The, oh, yeah. So, if you don't run the maintainer scripts, these apps don't work, you can't use them. I think most of the time is not spent in running the maintainer scripts but in running the unpacking and for the, what, what you should do probably inside one of these is to run the whole thing with eat my data and then do a sync at the end so you avoid these things in between. Yeah, or just, I guess you, uh, it would definitely be possible to just run the, uh, to have the whole image in tempfs and then eat my data, it doesn't matter because it's. Yeah, I used, uh, when I used S build, I used the tempfs to build on and it was much nicer. An overlay FS with uh, temp FS at the upper layer. Yeah. Um, so for people who are not super familiar with SCH roots, that's basically the equivalent of um, using an overlay FS for that. Basically, lets you reuse the same base image for all the shoots and as you spawn new, new shoots. So it would be a bit like using the same from for Docker build, I guess. Uh, the main difference is that here's a, uh, the, star, uh, the second layer of your sandbox would only exist in tempfs, so it's not actually written to disk, which is actually quite nice in terms of how fast it goes. Uh, the, yeah, of course it means that you use a bunch more RAM, but there are also ways we can deal with that. Um, 
yeah, I wanted to ask, like, um, are there people here already doing that sort of sandboxing for development environments or desktop applications, and what do you already use? Currently, I typically have um, a few S routes, but they're sort of long lived because I'll go into them. I need to isolate because for my work, I need to quite often try out some dodgy patches to Libc, which can't really go into a normal development environment because you know you can't break Libc; the world catches fire. Um, uh, so they're currently quite long lived, but again, that's because they're slow to set up. If they were fast to set up, I wouldn't keep them lying around as long because you know I'd have a cleaner start every time and I wouldn't get assumptions baked in, which does happen occasionally. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not doing anything clever at the moment, and I probably should. And at um, Cumulus, we're using a, as part of the build process. So for our release, we have um, truths tagged for each release that will have a set version of packages, Debian packages, plus the stuff we're building. Um, so it's a consistent environment for the build, and the developers will also use those. They can log into them, install their um, development versions of their packages, and test against what the actual release is. Um, so we're using them both as an automated build environment that gets run to build packages from source, and as also as a development environment for developers to be able to play around without uh, blowing anything else up. They do tend to be fairly long-lived. Um, and then people will set them up, install a bunch of dependencies, and then continue to develop within them. Um, but at new releases, they can always, you know, close it out, bring up a new one, and reinitialize everything. So that's maybe not the intended use, but that's how we found it actually works pretty nicely to use them. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that you had issues with developers kind of stomping on one another's, uh, one another's food by because they were using the same environments. Uh, what did you mean right. by that? So, right, so we use the, um, the shroots to avoid that happening. So every time they log in, they're, so we, the, this also has the advantage of having the build systems be isolated from the shroots they're running, so somebody doesn't install you know, packages within them uh, on the build system itself rather than within the shroot. Um, so, but one of the things we're looking at with that workflow is maybe using Docker to create a build environment where they can actually play around some and then nobody has access on the roots on the host systems apart from the sysadmins. So there's still some configuration I think to be done there. But it's worked. Um, the downside is that when you're loading a shroot it's a compressed file system so it has to decompress and then everything gets mounted um, and then they're in there and then when they exit it also has to recompress their personal copy of that. So there's a bit of a hit getting in and out of it, in and out of it like you would mentioned uh, starting up your environment. So uh, with the compression, I think you Strut, I think it supports LC4. I'm not sure. So that's at least relatively fast, I think. So the normally it uses GSIP, I think, and that's relatively slow. But if you use LC4, it's quite fast, I think. Yeah. Um, sorry. I Took a second to collect my thought. Uh, yeah, I think um, so. We we heard a bit from people who are already using that sort of things. I mentioned, for instance, I'm already also using a shroot. Uh, I think I would like also to people to mention what like what are. Uh, the main inconvenience you encounter. You mentioned that it's a bit slow to get in and out of the isolated environment. Um, but yeah, we didn't really hear about anything else. So if anybody wants to take the mic. Uh, so one of the things that I have to do um, occasionally is uh, sort of use the actual graphics hardware or sound hardware on the, on the machine. And you know it can be. Sometimes it's a bit of a pain remembering to um, mount all of the right things that a modern desktop environment needs into the chroot so things are exposed and things don't immediately. So uh, the thing that happened, I don't know if any of you were in my talk, but uh, one of my demos worked and the other one didn't. And the second one didn't work because if you don't have everything set up just right, um, Pulse Audio will go into a CPU-eating deadlock 
as soon as you try to play sound through it, uh, which is, I think, what broke my second demo, because I, I had one missing thing um, that wasn't mounted in the cheroot. Um, but you can't keep everything mounted all the time, because sometimes when you install a package, it will do things. And if it can actually communicate with the machine, then like a service might get killed if you mount all of the run directories and so forth. So you have to be careful. You can't keep them mounted all the time uh, in case you install a package which does interact with it. It's, it's a little bit different for me because the stuff that I'm doing is things that need to interact with desktop type things all the time, which I suppose isn't necessarily what, what people are always working with. But if you are in that use case, it's awkward. You need, you, need, you need two conflicting things. You want to be able to interact with the real system in some ways, but at the same time, you really, really don't want to touch certain services and, and, and so forth. So that's kind of a pain point for me. It's interesting because you said it's not necessarily what people are doing, but it's very much what you need to be doing if, uh, if you want to run desktop things at all. And right. so I mean, uh, since uh, Pabs mentioned Flatpak, uh, it's one of the things I've been looking towards there yeah, because they have all these problems to solve. They have a bunch of other problems they don't solve. And actually, I guess I will mention that as my major complaint currently, which is that it's actually there is actually no tooling to tell you, um, to basically tell you all oh, your shoot image has pending security updates you should update and things like that which is a problem both with Flatpak and Snap, but also with Docker, where it can be, I guess, a bit more of a problem if you run that like in a production environment. Because suddenly, well, suddenly you just don't have updates for, <laughs> for your production environment. Well, for Snaps, uh, there's a notification service, I think, which tells the developer who uploaded the Snap to the Snap Store tells them that they have security updates for the packages they include. But if, of course, if they build other software from Git or something, they don't get notifications for that. OK, I didn't know that Snap already built something for that. It's actually super encouraging. It's, it seems quite nice. OK, so uh, if nobody else wants to mention anything about that, I thought we could perhaps mention, uh, talk about, um, well, at least brainstorm about what we can do to like solve those problems. Because, so we mentioned that it takes a long time to set up uh, uh, environments, um, that it's difficult to actually get desktop stuff to run in there. And, oh yeah, and that we want or need um, Actually, uh, actu actually, the ability to know what is installed in terms of packages inside the environment, so that we can detect when there are updates available for it. And uh, I guess if nobody minds, I wouldn't mind starting with what can we do to make like set up faster for those environments? Because um, I'm using pBuilder with CowBuilder, and that's reasonably fast. It's There's a pre-built search route, and it creates a new directory, and I think it uses hard links to set up the temporary router first. Oh, so you mean that uh, CowBuilder avoids doing actual installations and... Yeah. Um, you create the search route, and that's... Mm -hmm primary storage and then when you're building a package it creates a hard linked copy of that. Oh, okay. And then it installs build dependencies and yeah. does a building. As okay, so that sounds fairly similar to what S build does if you use it with an overlay FS and TAMP FS or something like that. Yeah, the cow builder thing is a bit of a hack that predates overlay FS. So if if you get yeah. the choice to use overlay first, you should do that instead. Yes. Um. So I think another thing you could that could be considered maybe is like using Debian systems and build frameworks out of them for development or for running applications, and then stuff them into Austria or something, 
which uh, enables you to manage these frameworks and share the contents. And then you can just combine the frameworks together with your to uh, build your own uh, train route and work in that or run the app in it. Basically, like a flat pack works, but with Debian packages. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can add an overlay on top of that and then install any remaining packages you're missing, but you get a speed up because you have most of the packages already installed. Also, you mean basically putting more packages in the base image and not just, not just a result of the bootstrap, for instance. Yeah, you could have the base image, you could have then you could have an overlay, like mm -hmm. a GNOME overlay or a de uh, mm -hmm. development overlay, and then which has built essential installed and stuff, and then you could just install the remaining built dependencies when you're building the package, or when you're running an app, you could just install the remaining dependencies for that app, and then you save time for the setup. Yes, that's actually very fair that we could probably um, have multiple overlays and be able to reuse more stuff, uh, not just like the base image, but uh, more things on, uh, on top. Um, yes, yeah, so, something I was uh, also somewhat wondering about is, um, I mean, we can definitely cache environments. Like basically, if we, if I already built a given environment with a set of packages, and I, I decide uh, I want a, a similar environment again, um, probably because I'm running as build repeatedly or something, I could definitely just get a copy of the same one again without having to redo the whole. Uh, to reduce the whole setup phase, then I think that would be especially relevant if we are talking about sandboxing desktop apps and so on, because not, it might be fine to wait 30 seconds or something when we are first starting Firefox or LibreOffice or whatever. Uh, if I have to wait 30 seconds every time I open a LibreOffice document, I will be very, very sad. I think for desktop apps, Another approach we haven't talked about for desktop apps might be to just have normal devs and install them all on the host system and then basically bind mount the host system into a container and then run the app in there with some isolation and bind mount the stuff you need from the host system over there and maybe have <coughs> some app armor or SE Linux rules to further tighten this. Uh, yeah, but then like how much of the whole system do we mount inside the quote isolated and quote environment? Yeah, so uh, optimally we would just have like the user partition mounted there to have the whole OS, but that needs the whole user merge and handling of other stuff, maybe like ETC changes and VAR. Hmm. But it would be nice to have, I think because you can just run normal devs and you have the isolation you get with the snaps and flat packs, but you get all the advantages of the normal devs with security review and stable updates yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it's very much, at least for me, a goal to have, be able to use normal dev packages at least, at least so long as there is not a good consistent story for to have security maintenance of snap or flatback and so on. So I've, I've tried doing this with um, bubble wrap, the tool that Flatpak uses to sandbox applications. You can basically do it just with a few command line options. I've only used command line apps within bubble wrap and it works fine, but I haven't tried the graphical stuff. I guess that re would require some of the portal things that flat pack sets up, which I'm not sure how that works yet. Yeah, to, uh, as useful information for people here you, who might not know yet, uh, portals are um, also are not, uh, they are a security concept where basically instead of, for instance, if you have events in a sandbox, yeah, events is a PDF reader. So instead of giving it uh, access to all of slash home, because you know it might potentially read a PDF anyway in there. Uh, so instead of doing that, because 
then it has access to all your user data and the sandboxing is a bit pointless if it can just rifle through tilde slash dot gnupg or whatever else. And um, so instead of doing that, basically you give it access through a socket to a helper that runs outside the sandbox. And basically when, um, if you go file open, for instance, uh, events will just ask that helper, hey, please bring me a file open, open dialog. So the, um, the helper then displays the file open dialog from uh, GTK, for instance. So from a user perspective, there is no difference because it's the same graphical toolkit displaying the same window. And um, so the user picks whatever files they want to open. And then the helper sends back to the uh, to the application, uh, not a file path, but an already opened file descriptor. And so that's how you can basically move um, more or less ac handles for a file through the sandbox without having to grant extra stuff. So that's how it works for file mediation, but there are portals for things like webcam, webcam access and so on and so forth. Uh, I see that we have a bunch of people sitting in the back now. Uh, if you are sitting in the back because you do not want to be on camera, that's entirely fair. And I'm very glad that you feel comfortable coming in anyway. If you want to, if you are sitting in the back just because you arrived late, I would invite you to actually come sit with us. So, uh, yeah. And also, yeah, at any time, if you want to talk about something, just ask for a mic. Sorry, and now I entirely forgot what I was saying just before that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was saying, so that's how file mediation works with portals, but there are different portals for things like accessing the webcam and so on, and uh, those also give a fairly familiar um, user experience in the sense that it will do the same thing, for instance, that your web browser does, which is it will display you a tiny pop-up saying, okay, uh, application foo wants to access your microphone and webcam. And there you just get the choice to just say, no, I do not want events to access my webcam. <laughs> and uh, yes, they are, um, especially for sandboxing desktop application, quite useful because uh, they can achieve things security-wise that would be extremely hard to do with uh, Aparmo because basically because user, um, because there is no s fixed set of file you want to be reading or writing to with your application. Maybe this is a good point to introduce my idea for converting Debian into flatbacks. So I'm not sure how Many people know how OS tree and Flatpaks work, but OS tree is kind of a Git-based file store for systems. Uh, so you install the rootfs into a, into a, this Git-like directory structure, um, and Flatpaks are built on that. Um, so there are multiple parts of Flatpak. There's the runtimes. And then there's the applications, um, and they're both OS tree, both stored in. You can store everything in one particular OS tree repository. Um, and so my thoughts were that because of ABI changes and stuff like this that happen between stable and testing, and packages get removed, and so if you keep the old versions installed, you can't upgrade your system anymore. Um, so those, those are the two motivations for me for this idea. It was basically to create some OS tree base systems like for each of the bootstrap targets, min base, build D, um, and I think there's a couple of others. And then on top of that build one flat pack runtime per package and then build a dummy app that install that depends on that runtime um, and has a few things over the top so that it works without having to rebuild every single package with slash app instead of slash user. So that's the difference between the 
Flatpak apps is they're installed in slash app instead of slash user. Um, and so by doing this fake dummy thing, then we can get around that and build without having to build every package over again, which we already do on the build Ds. Um, so yeah. And because it's because everything's OS tree, it means that we would need we would do well to also have OS tree images for the base system and maybe a few of the task cell um, standard install options. That's the general idea. So, uh, quick question: If I understand correctly, you mean you would want to um, apt when installing packages to install them in an uh, in OS tree? Or? No, this would be pre-built OS tree slash oh. flatpak uh, repository. Okay. So you could just do go to GNOME Software and install flatpaks from Debian instead so. of flatpaks from FlatHub or wherever else. Okay, um, but then I, I guess I'm missing the part where you go from having Debian packages to having flat, uh, OS3 packages, basically. So um, the way it works is basically you de bootstrap, import that into a flat, flat pack, I mean into an OS3 repository, and then as a second layer, you do the runtimes, and import that into the, the OS tree repository, and then for each app package, you uh, upgrade, I mean, install the dependencies and the applications into those repositories, and then import that into, flip, into OS tree. So the advantage of using OS tree is that the files aren't duplicated, even if you have the same libraries in every flat pack, because the the it's a content-based store, so it's based on the SHA-256 uh, SHA of the file. Um, but besides the motivation of easy backports and installing obsolete removed packages, this would also enable the sandboxing stuff that you could use Debian packages with Debian security updates isolated in a flat pack environment using the portals and all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, that sounds kind of interesting because um, one of um, the problems that I see with the whole kind of we're going to ship applications in their little, their little carry bubble of con uh, containerized stuff is that you just, we're, to some extent we're in danger of pushing the how do we do security updates problem to over there and people say like well distributions are hard to do well yes they are hard to do the reason we put a lot of effort into them is that people don't have to do them over and over again and I, I, I like I like a lot of the things that the containerized stuff is doing but um, they say no it's okay we'll, we'll, we'll ship the runtime it's like well that kind of mutates into a distribution then at some point you know you, you're just doing the work and now you're doing it for five different versions of the runtime instead of maybe two versions, two releases of the distribution. Um, so that sounds like it might be an approach to, um, that could address that, sort of bridge the gap and hybridize the two approaches. The biggest problem with this idea, I think, is probably scalability. I don't know how well Tree would scale with like thousands and thousands and thousands of apps. I guess you could reduce the set by just creating apps for each uh, package that contains an app stream file. Uh, it should be easy to do. I just wanted to ask Julian, um, I know that dpackage now has a this dash dash root option. Do you know if apt also supports that now? Well, I don't think we have added support for that. But I guess you could probably work around it. There are several options to set a root DFR apt, and you could pass the root option to dpackage to by the apt option to pass options to dpackage. So it might work, but I'm not sure how to configure it. Yeah, 
si since you mentioned the scalability issue in like, making a single OS3 repository with many, many, many packages in it, um, would it make sense to uh, instead um, have like regular dev packages and on my machine the first time I say please install LibreOffice in, in a sandbox, basically build a local OS3 repository? Would that work out? I think that could work, but it does mean that potentially thousands of client machines are doing that instead of the work being done centrally in one place once. Um, so there's trade-offs. Uh, so with regard to scalability, um, I, you know, apologies if anyone from Endless is already here, but I think Endless already use OS3 to deliver their operating system and it is Debian derived. So um, I think it's Debian derived, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, so I, I, I believe it does actually scale reasonably well to large numbers of packages. I have no first-hand experience of that, but that's what I've heard talking to people from Endless. Yeah, we'll definitely check it out then, but if they have, like, the whole Debian archive in OS3, then it definitely will work for us. The other thing about scalability in this idea is that because I want to have obsolete things that have been removed from Debian that people might still rely on, that don't necessarily need uh, security updates because maybe they're a game and they don't have, don't use the internet. So it could end up being that there are a lot more packages in there from the history of, uh, from snapshot Debian org. Um, so yeah, that could, and because everything, all the tool chain and library versions change a lot, there'll be a lot more files in there. So yeah. Um, well, I, I will relay perhaps question. Should we move on to another topic? Okay. Uh, could someone remind me what were the other two things we wanted to discuss? There was. Uh, how to reduce setup times for those um, sandboxes, uh, and I forgot entirely what was the other two. What? Oh, I. Hmm. Uh, as build as in how to use those environments for building packages or. Okay, so there was a bit of earlier discussion about asbuild. Uh, it was mostly as like as build and as shoot as as inspiration and possibly as like a tool we can extend to do what we need um, or not, depending on what we end up doing. Uh, there was not a lot of discussion, I think, about uh, asbuild. Uh, specifically, but basically, if you if you can uh, if you give uh, if you have the ability to set up an environment with uh, uh, and install the ex extra packages and so on, uh, as well can definitely use that as a backend. I don't know if that answers but what you had in mind, but yeah, it's very much something I have an eye on because you know if we want to be able to, for instance, um, uh, if you are a Debian mentor and routinely get packages from people you are mentoring and build those, uh, it's, yeah, you probably might not want to have your whole system, system exposed to whatever is in Debian rules and what's not. Um, um, ba -ba -ba. Should we talk about stuff like uh, pip install, sandboxing? Like yes, please. Language That's... package managers, where you build the applications, you download stuff from the internet, and execute setup.py scripts and stuff. Yes, please. That's very re relevant. My 
to say, oh, well, I wouldn't go as far as to say as I have a plan because having a plan is like far more organized than <laughs> any of that stuff is, at least as far as I've been working on it. But um, like basically, the kind of idea I had is if we can provide people with sandboxes, um, you could I could do stuff uh, like whenever I cd into devil python my shell just dumps me instead in uh, in my sth root or whatever in my sandbox for python stuff and there I have my own python uh, I, there I have pip installed but if I pip install whatever it can only touch my python development environment for instance but I would love to hear if you have like more thoughts about that things because I so far it was at least in my mind just another application to confine and not anything really special. I don't know, you might want to have an application in Python that you want to install with pip and then you want the application to access your home directory later on but you don't want the build process to be able to, ac to access your home directory so you could like build a special sandbox that contains just uh, your uh, pip modules you have installed locally in your home directory and then bind all that into the uh, sandbox and build the module in there and then just uh, exit the sandbox and run the application later on in the host system or sandbox it to somehow. Okay, that's pretty interesting and I didn't give any thought to that. And is anybody else wants to react or? Okay, I guess we're still like all kind of digesting your ideas still. Um, guess what I would be uh, kind of concerned about is um, it can give people perhaps a fake sense of security in the sense. I don't know if all of you heard, so I will guess summarize. There was recently a fairly high profile attack on NPM, which is a JavaScript package manager. And um, so basically what happened is that one developer got their account compromised and they had access to a very popular linter. And what the, what the attackers then did is basically publish a new version of the linter that would uh, automatically grab credentials for, uh, access, for uploading to NPM and send those over to basically a server they controlled. And, um, I mean, that sort of stuff could definitely happen like in other package manager, like cargo or pip or whatever. It could even potentially happen in Debian. Like one Debian developer gets compromised, a uh, bad upload is sent for pip, uh, for Lintian. And since we all run Lintian, hopefully, uh, then we are all compromised. Mm -hmm. Woo! Um, and yeah, that's a very big part of like why I organize this both and why I, n not particularly this attack because it happened like really recently, but that sort of concern is more or less what motivates, I think, at least my need for um, isolated development environments and applications. And so, yeah, if we are saying we should um, build PIP applications, for instance, in, in a sandbox, but make them available, like unconfined, I would be kind of concerned about the same thing happening and uh, just having a bad application running unconfined uh, directly. Yeah, that's true. Maybe you want to have them differently confined for the build and the runtime. Okay, so is that a <laughs> that's actually a pretty good idea because uh, there is no reason why pip should have access to my webcam, but perhaps if I'm installing whatever um, uh, a streaming application, I might actually want the application to have access to my webcam and so on. Um, I mean, if we su support thing, uh, things like as builds, uh, should be possible to also support like yeah. doing a pip install, whatever. It's uh, not just malicious things or other language package managers. So, you know, if uh, proprietary software developers provided .deb, you know, quite often, and I think mostly for reasons of inexperience, they do some 
hilariously inadvisable things in their post-in scripts. Yes. Uh, so I usually pull out the post-in script and just have a look at it. And quite often it's like, you know what? No, you don't actually need to run for me to install this application. I'll repack the dev without it. Um, but it would be nice to isolate. So I've seen ones that um, try to, uh, they do a few things. So one is it removes uh, any cached config for that application, which was not completely unreasonable, but from your home directory, which is like, mm, I don't think that should really be happening in the post-in script. The application should be taking care of it itself when it, when it starts. And it also tried to kill anything with its own running name. <laughs> As that's fairly exciting, actually. Yes, yes, that so, was the reason that didn't get run. So um, that's what I meant with untrusted devs. So I basically yeah. create declarative maintainer scripts would be the first step, and then you could have um, devs that you can safely install without them doing anything evil to your system. And then if you combine that with sandboxing for the actual app itself, you could have a safe app, basically. You can install random third-party packages and use them with the same safety guarantees as you have with containerized uh, package formats like snaps and flat packs. Yeah, that sounds. That sounds actually like something we we very much would like to have. Yeah, and that's my vision, like for the last two DevCons or so. Oh, <laughs> we need to talk more then. I think we're out of time, so. Already? Um, oh yes, we have even like five progress. minutes over or something. So yeah, I. Uh, well, thank you all very much, and I uh, will probably try to go through the recording at some point and kind of summarize the discussion, write uh, and send the summary to DebConf Discuss. So if all of you are already in there, we'll send it there. If for some reason uh, you are not on DebConf Discuss, that's entirely fine. And if you want me to send you the summary anyway, please let, let me know and I will just BCC you to that email so nobody has to know you are not on the conf discuss. <laughs> and yes, thanks a lot again. I feel it was a fairly productive discussion and we have a lot of new stuff to work on which, um, well, you know, new things to work on. Uh, not all, it doesn't always feel positive in the sense that now the to-do list got bigger but at least we know what we have to work on to make that sort of stuff happen, I guess, at least which directions we need to work on. So thanks again, everyone.